We welcome all of you in this webinar, which is an expert's pull, pulse webinar. Today, the time is 2.30 to 3.30 local time. We have two interesting topics, and I will introduce them separately to you before we go towards the individual session. Before we start, there are some house rules to be followed during the webinar. To ensure the clarity for our, the speaker, all the other participants are muted during the webinar. Still, we will give you the opportunity to ask question into the Q&A box, which you can see into your panel. Kindly ask your questions only in the Q&A box because the chat option is uh, developed for this. This webinar will be recorded for documentation purpose. And also, if you want to ask a live question at the end when we open for Q&A, you can raise your hand and we will try to unmute you depending upon the availability of time. And then you can ask your live questions. Thank you for that. The agenda for today is very, very time packed. So that's why we are starting on time and we will go slowly so that we can finish the session and can have a good time for discussion. My name is Dr. Ravi Tewari. I'm the medical head for established product for Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei at Sanofi based in Kuala Lumpur. Today we have two topics with us, optimizing BP control without getting a haircut, a very interesting topic by Dr. Chu. And then we have a topic on a very, very relevant clinical topic of de-escalation, followed by the Q&A. So uh, my name is Dr. Ravi Tiwari, and I'm opening the session now. Uh, before I start this session to be handed over to Dr. Chu, I think this is a very, very unique time. I will not use the, any other term. It's a very unique time when we all are passing through a very, very different phase in our life. We are homestuck, homebound or wherever we are in the COVID-19 situation. And everybody is contributing their best to tackle the situation. And that's where we all come together in terms of not even compromising the medical education. So that's where the webinar gives a very important opportunity for all of us so that we can hear to the experts without disturbing their schedule and without any traveling and definitely maintaining the concept of social distancing. Of course, uh, we, will, we, we are passing through a difficult time and even the healthcare professionals are contributing a lot to this. So before I hand over the session to Dr. Chu, it's my privilege to introduce him as a speaker today. Dr. Chu is a consultant cardiologist currently at CVSKL Hospital. Remember this webinar is in collaboration with CVSKL Hospital along with Sanofi. Dr. Chu, began his career in cardiology in around 1999 at the National Heart Center Singapore and later at the National Heart Institute of Malaysia. Dr. Chu joined CVSKL Hospital, which is his current appointment, as a consultant interventional cardiologist in November 2017. After having practiced for around 14 years at KPJ Selangor Medical Center and Shubangja Medical Center, which are well reputed institutions at Malaysia. His academic credentials are worthy of note, having published in peer-reviewed journals, for example, Journal of Interventional Cardiology, Blue Intervention, British Journal of Cardiology, Chinese Medical Journal, Asian Heart Journal, Malaysian Medical Journal, to name a few. Dr. Chu has also co-authored book chapters, very, very relevant book chapters, and some of the Malaysian clinical practice guidelines. He continues to be actively involved as a faculty member, of many conferences and educational workshops in the field of cardiology, not only locally, but also cross-border internationally. Dr. Chu has a leadership role in the National Heart Association of Malaysia and Asia Pacific Society of Intervention Cardiology. He is a part of the steering committee of our national cardiovascular database for percutaneous coronary intervention and the Malaysia STEMI network. So without further ado, I think it's it's time to start with this very interesting topic, optimizing BP control without getting a haircut. Over to you, Dr. Chu, and you can share your slides just over a number. Thank you very much, Dr. Ravi. Let me just uh, bring up my slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Perfectly okay. Thank you once again. I want to thank Sanofi for the collaboration and the opportunity to be able to continue to share uh, education and uh, interesting uh, learning points with our friends. And it's also interesting that now with this kind of platform, 
you are reaching out to colleagues not only in Malaysia but all over the region. I understand that we have friends from Indonesia, Philippines uh, joining us as well. So my topic will be trying to share with you about how we can further improve our patient's blood pressure control without actually going to the barber. Well, these are my disclosures. I also want to have a disclaimer that the uh, presentation is entirely my own and not, uh, does not reflect the opinion of Sanofi. So why this haircut? Well, those in Malaysia will probably understand why, but since we have friends from, from the region, let me explain to you that uh, this all started with this chap here. This guy is one of the state assemblymen from one of the states up north. And in the attempt to try to relax the uh, movement uh, control during the COVID-19, he wanted the government to let barbers open shop. And he quoted an article or manuscript from the New England Journal of Medicine that says that when you cut your hair, you can lower the blood pressure. Uh, mind you, look at his hairstyle. Look at that line. All these three guys are politicians, same haircut. I think they must have been to the same barber. And uh, if those who don't know the guy on this side here, this is the architect of the current backdoor government and arguably one of the most despised person in the country today. Anyhow, so the question is why, and if you come to Malaysia, if you go to the barbershop, especially the Indian barbershop, you get a lot of extra services. So ladies, if you don't understand, your, your, your husband or your son, when he goes to the barbershop, he gets a lot of extra services. Massage, neck massage, but the best part is the neck cracking. So really the question is, why would New England General Medicine accept a clinical trial data coming from barbershops? to lower blood pressure. It must be a something of significance. So how do you think that the blood pressure is actually reduced? Do you think that by cutting the hair, you actually bring down your sympathetic nervous discharge? Or is this a pure psychological standpoint that when you look good after a new haircut, your blood pressure will go down? But I think maybe more likely the, it's the massage rather than the haircut causing the blood pressure to come down. Or is this because that politician, he has a basic degree in medicine, though he's not been a medical practitioner for a long time, maybe he says so. So we'll come back to this topic uh, along the way, but let's, in the next few 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to run with you maybe very briefly about where we've come as far as hypertension is concerned. We look at some historical facts and it's the importance of hypertension on the, the uh, patient's outcome. We want to revisit a common sense topic of how to measure blood pressure properly. And that will stay, sort of set the stage to how far we should actually lower the blood pressure and what we are actually achieving in real life and why there's actually a discordance in terms of what we think we should be achieving and the real world, uh, real world achievement of blood pressure targets before looking at how we can improve the blood pressure control. The oldest medical text in the world, Huang Di Neijing, came from China 5,000 years ago and the Chinese physicians, by feeling the pulse of the patients, are able to, de to define that there's thickening of the pulse when the patient takes excessive salt. Basically, they are actually correlating excessive salt intake with presence of hypertension and atherosclerosis. And when they describe that these patients get drops of swelling, they're actually describing the complication of heart failure as a result of uncontrolled hypertension. The earliest treatment are really, well, we're not going to sort of use it today but basically you want to bleed the patient whether by leech or cupping and thereby by causing hypotension you actually cause hypotension and that's how you reduce your blood pressure but we have really changed a lot in terms of our, percep of our perception of high blood pressure even in the 1940s we think that the pressure of 210 110 is considered mal and benign and should not be treated and there were many who believed that this blood pressure is all up in the head rather than a true physical problem if you want to look at history of the natural history of, of high blood pressure and the impact, you can never get any better than the history of the 32nd president of the US, President Franklin Roosevelt. At the age of 48, his blood pressure was normal. A few years later, he became the president, then his blood pressure went up to 162.98. The president's physician, Admiral Ross McIntyre, thought it was not necessary to treat. As the blood pressure went up further, what they had was just sedation with phenobarbital and massage. By about 10 years later, uh, he already had 
symptoms and signs of heart failure. The treatment was low salt diet, restrict his alcohol and cigarette intake and bit rest. Soon, he started to have a series of cerebrovascular accidents. And in 1945, at a meeting uh, in Crimea, Russia, Lord uh, Winston Churchill found that his friend, Franklin Roosevelt, wasn't doing well. So he asked his personal physician, Lord Moran, to have a look at him. And this was Lord Moran's verdict. The president appears very ill. I'll give him no more than a few months to live. And true enough, two months later, he died suddenly of a massive intracerebral hemorrhage. And his blood pressure that was measured just before his moment of death was 300 over 190. The whole spectrum of the presentation of hypertension untreated was seen in the president of the United States of America. Because back then, there was very little that we can do. Because even in the 1940s, the treatment for hypertension included watermelon, cucumber seed, mistletoe, and garlic. And the patients with high blood pressure were not supposed to have sex and have red meat. Very hard to follow, isn't it? So really, hypertension is a major global problem. One in 10 deaths around the world today could be attributed to hypertension. The World Health Organization has made it a target that by 2025, we should try to reduce the prevalence of hypertension by about 25%. The burden of hypertension is especially great in developing countries. In Southeast Asia, one in every three adults have high blood pressure. If you look at the attributable cause of death globally, high blood pressure stands out as the leading cause. When we look at the orange and yellow bars, it's especially impactful in Asia. In Malaysia, one in three adults may be hypertensive. The worst part is that for every two person who was diagnosed to have high blood pressure, another three were actually undiagnosed. If you look at the curve or the relationship between increasing systolic blood pressure and death due to stroke or ischemic heart disease, it is a linear curve. The higher your blood pressure, the higher the risk of cardiovascular death from these conditions. And with every increasing age, your actual risk amplifies increase much higher. If you look at between Asians and Caucasians, it seems that the curve for Asians is much steeper, meaning that Asians are more sensitive to the harmful effects of high blood pressure compared to our Caucasian counterparts. This is an important slide because if you look at this epidemiological data, from a baseline pressure of 11575, for every increment of 20 systolic and 10 diastolic, you have a doubling of risk for cardiovascular mortality. And this is one of the basis of how the Americans came up with a threshold for diagnosis of hypertension. We will come to that. Treating high blood pressure doesn't need to do very much. Just two millimeter reduction in your systolic blood pressure will confer about 10% reduction in stroke death, as well as 7% reduction in ischemic heart disease mortality. If some of you think that treating high blood pressure is expensive because of the expensive medications, look at this cost-effective analysis. Here in UK, all these bullets here refer to treatment with different antihypertensive agents. Actually treating them is much cheaper in the long run compared to here, the diamond, which is no treatment for men or women with high blood pressure. So really, treating hypertension is cheaper than not doing anything at all. It is very clear that controlling blood pressure is unquestionably perhaps the most cost-effective way to prevent premature cardiovascular mobility and mortality. But be, before we even go to think about how we diagnose and assess whether the control is good, let's talk about whether we should be measuring correctly. BP measurement came a long way from the early days of the first sphygmoid manometer, which could only sort of diagnose the systolic blood pressure by palpation to the uh, measurement of the height of the blood column punctured through the carotid artery of the neck here by uh, Professor Stephen Hills. Today, we can measure blood pressure. Why am I teaching you about measuring blood pressure? It's a no-brainer, isn't it? All of us were taught back in medical school. Well, some of you think that it may be easy. It is not a, it's easy to, to understand, but some of guys may be, I'm not saying that you're stupid, but some guys are really not so smart because he thinks that the kidney is in the heart. But anyhow, the fact is, if you measure blood pressure properly in a number of studies, if you use a guideline-based guideline proper way of measuring blood pressure, compared to your usual way of measuring blood pressure, you actually will get about 10 millimeters systolic 
seven millimeter diastole, lower blood pressure compared to your routine way of measuring blood pressure. If you do that, that changes the whole thing about the diagnosis or who the number of patients you diagnose with high blood pressure or how many of them are actually controlled with hypertensive treatment. There is a full section on how to measure blood pressure in the recent guidelines. Here in the 2017 American Guideline of Blood Pressure, they talk about getting the patient ready for measurement, having the patient relax for at least five to 10 minutes before having the blood pressure measured, sitting upright with the back sort of rested, making sure that they have no coffee, no cigarette about half an hour before the measurement of the blood pressure, making sure that they've emptied the bladder, looking at making sure that you have a calibrated machine and the cuff is a proper size, placed properly, and how fast you deflate the cuff, looking at also how you measure the blood pressure when there are fluctuations. All these things matter. In fact, in the most recent guideline released by the International Society of Hypertension, look, it should be published in June, but we have an, an e-print that is out. They have also a full section just on how to measure blood pressure. Because all these small, small things which are common sense, matter. Just by getting the patients to rest properly, you can actually reduce the pressure by 12 to 6, 12 systolic and 6 diastolic uh, blood pressure, proper size of the cuff, making, deflating the cuff properly. All these matter. And the only thing is that if you want to do this proper guideline, uh, rec uh, sort of recommended ways of measurement, you might have to spend up to 8 to 10 minutes extra to get the proper blood pressure measurement. So we understand today there are a lot of limitations on your office blood pressure measurement. There are a lot of errors and there's a lot of variability when patient comes to measure in the blood pressure in the office. There are issues with white coat as well as mass hypertension that are not going to be recognized with office blood pressure measurements. So all these guidelines have really emphasized the use of, out on, of our office blood pressure measurement in the form of home blood pressure monitor or an ambulatory 24 hour blood pressure monitor. You're gonna have at least a third of your patients having white coat hypertension. These are patients with high blood pressure only in the clinic, as well as up to a third of patients having mass hypertension, normal blood pressure in the clinic, but raised blood pressure at home. And this is important. Now, white coat is a real phenomenon. This is a very elegant study by uh, Professor Giuseppe Mancia. Back in the 1980s, they have an intra-arterial cannula to measure the blood pressure. No sort of actual interaction between a physician and the patient, but as long once the doctor walks into the room, his blood pressure goes up and it came down as, as the doctor walks out. So it's a true phenomenon. It also matters who measures the blood pressure. You, consistently, every time a doctor measurement is higher than a nurse measurement. So the white coat effect is more pronounced uh, with you measuring rather than your assistant. So it is a question really, maybe should we delegate some of this measurement to our uh, sort of uh, nurses and also our allied healthcare personnel. But of course, you have to train your nurse how to measure properly. If you don't train them properly, they actually might get an even higher, uh, extremely high blood pressure measurement. This is important because out of office blood pressure measurements has been well correlated, better than office measurement, to look at end organ damage like left ventricular hypertrophy or albuminuria both systolic and diastolic, much better with the outdoor office measurement versus the, versus the office measurements. The ambulatory blood pressures are also better to predict mortality, both systolic and diastolic measurements. So you can see very clearly, white coat hypertension seem to have very sort of almost normal in terms of prognosis with those with non who are normal tensive, but we know that with follow-up, they are more likely to develop true hypertension. Those with mass hypertension, is as high at risk as those with uncontrolled hypertension, which is why the guideline is very clear that if you have mass hypertension, you are going to start treatment immediately for these patients. We have gone very far today with the availability of variables with a lot of devices, including your mobile phones to measure blood pressure. I've also seen a device that could actually measure uh, blood pressure from your underpants. I'm not sure what part of the body they are measuring, but there are also a lot of apps in your mobile phone that are able to get the patient to monitor or record their blood pressure. Getting the patient engaged and involved in the treatment will actually improve the compliance uh, of the, uh, their blood pressure of, uh, treatment. Now, how do you then define high blood pressure? Over the years, I think it's been clear 
that the definition has always been about 14090. That's the European guideline in 2018. There, of course, there are different thresholds for the out-of-office blood pressure measurements. We won't go into that. Malaysian guidelines are very similar. 14090 is a cutoff for the, the definition of hypertension. But US is always different. They are always against the rest of the world. You know, you are clearly understanding in 2017, they actually reduced the threshold to 130 by 70, or 130 by 80. So a lot more patients in, have, in America, if you use new definition, are going to be hypertensive. By just changing the definition or the criteria from a third of US being labeled as hypertensive, now nearly half of Americans are actually hypertensive by definition. Then how low then should you go in terms of the blood pressure recording? Let's look at the last column. Americans are crazy because they say that all across the board, regardless of your risk profile, primary, secondary prevention, aim for 130, 80, regardless of age as well. Most of the other guidelines, especially Europeans, are more reasonable. They are targeting now, looking at ranges between below 140, but up to 130. 130 to 140 is systolic, and between 70 to 80 diastolic blood pressure. The concept of having a range rather than a target or threshold is because if you put a threshold, you say below 140, the, blood, the patient's blood pressure is going to fluctuate between office visits. It might be sometimes higher, it may be lower. And you're going to accept that sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. But you give them a range between 130 and 140. What we want is that most of the blood pressure recordings in the clinics should be within 130 to 140 and less of the spikes beyond 140. So the guidelines have clearly showed that you want to aim for between 130 to 139 systolic blood pressure. In the elderly age group, you may be a bit more lenient, especially look at Malaysians, we are very lenient with the systolic blood pressure achievement in the elderly. If you look at the clinical trials, the achievement of systolic blood pressure is good, 120 to 130, most of them. So it is actually achievable, but you actually need a lot of medication to achieve that. But what we are actually doing in real life are we actually getting what we're seeing in the clinical trials? Here in the PURE study, about 140,000 patients, we find that only less than half of the patients are actually treated for hypertension. The control is actually very dismal, less than 15%. All across the world is also very clear there is a varying rate of hypertension control. Most of them are quite uh, dismal, below 30 to 40% blood pressure control. Why are we not getting to the targets? Of course, this issue of difficult patients, we always blame the patients of being not adherent to the prescribed medications or the lifestyle. It could be a difficult disease because of secondary hypertension or resistant hypertension, or it could be difficult doctors. Hours. Treatment inertia is one of the big things. So it's very clear that in treating chronic diseases, if you prescribe the patient a medication, some are not going to take your prescription and get it filled. Even if they get it filled or they buy the medication, they may not be taking the medication. But worst of all, majority after a period of six months to one year would not be adherent to the therapy. Even in the best of centers, this is a, a center of excellence for blood pressure in Leicester, up to a one in every four of the high blood pressure patients do not adhere to the medications. Why? Many reasons. It can be our fault because we are giving them very difficult regime to follow, multiple dosing, Polypharmacy, a big issue, especially in elderly and those with other comorbidities. Cost, yes, it's truly a problem. Side effects, maybe, but sometimes it may be a knowledge and perception factor. Because if you ask the patient, many of them quote reasons like, I forget. I don't think I need the medications anymore because I'm feeling better. So you see that a lot of reasons why they're not taking the medications actually behavioral. Here is just a, a study that looking at patients who are thought to be resistant to hypertension. They are given the maximum number of drugs. Now they are thought to be resistant. They are actually considered for what we call a renal denervation therapy, a device therapy for high blood pressure. But when they measure these patients' drug levels, up to a third of them are not taking the medications. So a lot of the so-called uncontrolled or resi resistant medications, resistant hypertensive, is because they are not taking the medications. And once the patients are actually aware that they are being monitored, they start taking the medications and they are no longer resistant anymore in terms of their blood pressure control. Let's now come back to the haircut story. So this paper in 2018 in New England Journal of Medicine says that you might be able to lower blood pressure 
If you look at the study design, not a very big study, up to six months, mainly in black patrons, is basically a pharmacist-led intervention. A pharmacy is actually placed in a bubble shop. This pharmacy is going to prescribe, measure the, pa the patient's blood pressure, prescribe the antihypertensive, advise good lifestyle changes and monitor the patient. And they're actually prescribing what is actually recommended today, a CCD together with an ARB uh, or RAS blocker as the first line of treatment. And of course, at six months, those who are treated in active intervention, this is baseline, have a lower blood pressure compared to the control group. So really, was it the haircut that dropped the blood pressure? Not really, right? Because it's actually what we call the Horton effect. This is an experiment in Chicago in a factory that manufactures parts of telephone. When they increase the lighting of the factory and, and the workers are aware they are being monitored, their productivity went up. When they dim the lighting and the productivity dropped again. So the same thing like in clinical trials, when the patients are monitored, they're repeatedly advised about compliance, they will take the medications. But if they are not watched, they will forget or they will not adhere to medication. The other issue is us. There are many a times we do not initiate or intensify treatment when it's needed. And it is, ex it is actually predicted or, or sort of suspected that up to two thirds of poor achievement of blood pressure control in the US is because of us phys physicians. Here in a paper in a GP setting, when a patient's blood pressure is not well controlled, only 15% of the GPs actually initiate any modification of treatment. Majority left the blood pressure treatment alone. It is known that if you start combination therapy early, along the line up to two years, more of these patients will be on combination therapy. If you start on monotherapy, very, very little change is done to the patient's pharmacological regimen. These are behavioral issues. Apart from that, there are other things that we should always remember. All the guidelines are very clear that the backbone of therapy to lower blood pressure is also lifestyle. Do not forget that because all these things like diet, low salt intake, exercise, moderation in alcohol do actually lower blood pressure. So then we come to how you manage or treat the blood pressure. In this uh, meta-regression analysis, with different kinds of blood pressure lowering agents, as long as you lower the blood pressure, you actually achieve a reduction in death. So it really doesn't matter by whatever means that you lower the blood pressure, there is actually important, important reduction in a patient's mortality. And here again, looking at all the different pharmacological agents with low blood pressure, whether looking at major CV events or mortality, all are the same as long as you bring down the blood pressure. So blood pressure lowering is of primary importance, not so much the agent that you use. We also understand that blood pressure has got hypertension, has got multiple pathophysiology. So it actually goes according to common reason that you have to use multiple agents to achieve the blood pressure goal. Most of the trials show that you need two or three medications to achieve the, the target. Here's just a, a, an example. This is an eye combined study in patients who are on one single agent, a CCD, and of five milligram, not well controlled. They were randomized a fixed dose combination of ibuprofen with, with a CCB or kept them on amlodipine alone and then a forced titration about five weeks later to a higher dose of CCB. You find that here, just looking at here, those with persist on amlodipine versus adding a combination with a ARB have a better reduction in systolic blood pressure as well as both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Here, we must understand that the fact that you want to recommend people to start combination early is because regardless of whatever agent that you start off with here in the red bars, as long as you add on a second agent from a different class, you're going to achieve about up to five times greater blood pressure lowering. So multiple pathophysiological mechanism as your target is much better to lower blood pressure rather than trying to intensify a monotherapy up to the maximum dose. It's also clear that when you do a combination therapy early, here this trial showed that there's actually important reduction in cardiovascular events as well as in mortality. And it's actually found the reason why there's important reduction in outcomes because you achieve blood pressure lowering earlier. If you have the patients that are needing many, many medications, the more drugs they are on, the worse they are in terms of adherence or compliance. So the therapy is a known fact. So if you need to treat these patients with many antihypertensive drugs, giving them a single pill combination is going to be more successful to keep them on a drug rather than multiple pill 
separate pills. So all the guidelines today are recommending to start early combination therapy because it achieves a faster and more sustained blood pressure control. There's less variability in the response. It's probably safer because you're using lower doses and better tolerated. Has a lower pill burdens and more likely for the patient to adhere. We overcome some of the inertia on our part and we improve the patient's outcome. The core drug treatment strategy has been recommended in the European uh, Society of Cardiology guideline to start with a RAS blocker with a CCB or diuretic as a, as a first line with two drugs first. As a, from the word go, at least two drugs, if it's still not better, take all three drugs and consider other additional agents if the blood pressure is still un, not well controlled. The latest ISH guideline is somewhat similar, except that they would like you to maximize the CCB together with the ARB combination first before adding on the third drug, which is a diuretic, before considering the, all the other agents as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I think it's clear that hypertension is not going to go away. It will continue to be a major contributor to the global um, cardiovascular epidemic and a lot of morbidity and mortality to our patients. We've seen that we have many different thresholds to define blood pressure. Just choose one and go with that. To have a meaningful diagnosis of high blood pressure and to assess whether your blood pressure is well controlled, you need to pay attention to how you measure the blood pressure. We must recognize many of our patients have mass hypertension as well as white coat hypertension. So increase your use of out of office blood pressure measurement. There are different BP targets from different guidelines. In general, you want to achieve a target between 120, 130 for systolic, 70 to 80 diastolic. You might want to be a bit more lenient with the elderly patients. Most patients will need two or more drugs. So start early with the drug combination, especially in the fixed dose combination. We have now seen that the guidelines are emphasizing on us to detect or check that the patients are adhering to therapy. So start with combination therapy early, especially fixed dose combination. We also think that BP targets should be achievable like what we see in the ideal clinical trials. We think that many a times it is not achievable. The, the, what we see in clinical trials is uh, only in the ideal setting. Not true because we see very clearly that if you follow the right tools and right environment effort on your part, we can achieve the blood pressure reduction. We may not be able to get it to target, but please understand that any blood pressure reduction, even not to the target, will yield significant respect reduction for our patient. So we, to implement an ideal blood pressure control of our patient requires a multi-pronged approach, behavioral intervention for both the patients and ourselves. We have to be better educated. We have to choose the right pharmacological strategy of early use of combination therapy, perhaps in a single pill combination, and sometimes you have to think about a device therapy. With that, I'm sure that successful BP control can become a reality for all our patients and we can improve the outcome. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Chu. It was a fantastic session just on time. And really, I love the way you have shown your pictorials and correlated the haircut story as well. Thanks a lot. And it was very, very clear to all of us. Now I take the opportunity that I share, I, I just introduce our next speaker for the topic. And again, it gives me pleasure to invite and introduce Dr. Datuk, Dr. Rosli Muhammad Ali, who is again a consultant cardiologist from CVSKL current appointment. Dr. Rosli received his MD and MRCP from the National University of Malaysia and Royal College of Physician UK, respectively. In 1986, he began his medical career serving in Penang General Hospital. He then began training in cardiology with National Heart Institute, KL. And in 1996, he was promoted to a consultant cardiologist at National Heart Institute, which is a prominent institute in cardiology in Malaysia. He assumed the position of head of cardiology department from 2006 to 2015 and further as a chief clinical officer from 15 to December 2016. He served as the president of National Heart Association of Malaysia and resident of the Asian Federation of Cardiology from the year 2014 to 2016. Dr. Rosby has participated in numerous international multi-center studies as both principal and co-principal investigator. He has also taken up position as organizing chairman for my live conference. Dr. Rosley has also appeared in media on 
all forms and has been speaker, chairperson, moderator, live operator, panelist, commentator, and faculty member at local and international congresses. So without further ado, it gives me pleasure to hand over the session to Dr. Rosley to take us through the next topic of discussion today. Dr. Rosley, you can share your screen. So thank you very much, uh, Ravi. And um, it's been uh, a pleasure to be on this uh, webinar. Uh, I must say that my slides are not as colorful as, uh, as uh, uh, Gimhui's, but uh, we'll try and see and we, with, whether we can cover this uh, within appropriate time. Can you see my slides? Um, all right, okay. Yes. All right, okay. So we're gonna talk about something a bit different, which is de-escalation of anti therapy in patients with acute coronary syndrome. Um, so this is uh, uh, really a different uh, topic altogether from uh, hypertension. Now, as you know, platelets, activated platelets are central to the formation of thrombus in acute coronary syndrome. And therefore, the treatment has been, one of the main of treatment is looking at uh, antiplatelet therapy, therefore to reduce uh, the uh, thrombus formation and reduce uh, ischemic events. So we have got aspirin and subsequently clopidogrel as a mainstay of treatment. But as you know, um, not very recently, but fairly recently, we've got two other drugs that are more potent than aspirin. And this is prasugrel and picagrelor. And they have shown in two different studies to show that prasugrel with uh, uh, aspirin or ticagrelor with aspirin is more potent and more beneficial in, in terms of reducing primary endpoint of death, MI or stroke as compared to the aspirin combination with clopidogrel. So that has been shown. In triton TB38, it is uh, mainly in patients with acute coronary syndrome who uh, underwent uh, STEMI, uh, acute coronary syndrome who underwent uh, PCI, but uh, for plateau, ticagrelor, it is both for medically treated, uh, for both STEMI and also non-STEMI, both medically treated or by uh, PCI. Although the STEMI subarm or subgroup is treated uh, just purely with PCI. So those are better. And therefore, the, when you look at the current guidelines, it is stated that when you have patients with acute coronary syndrome, you should be giving dual antiplatelet therapy and should be given ticagrelor either for medical or for patients who are undergoing PCI or prasugrel. And these are only patients who undergo PCI because in medically treated patients, there was no difference between prasugrel or clopidogrel for the DAPT arm. If uh, the patients cannot tolerate for either ticagrelor or, tic uh, or prasugrel, then clopidogrel should be the second choice. So that's where the guidelines uh, are. But, uh, and, and the reason is this, because there are certain differences between uh, the three uh, types of uh, medications. And this is a graph to, uh, to show you the differences between the three groups. Clopidogrel and prasugrel are tinopyridines. They are irreversible, whereas ticagrelor is a totally different compound altogether, and it's a reversible drug. The fact that uh, it is, uh, uh, of the, free, the way that uh, uh, it is activated, Ticagrelor is uh, activated uh, immediately. Uh, it is an active compound, whereas prasugrel is a prodrug that has to be uh, activated. But it goes for a one-step procedure in the liver, whereas clopidogrel has to be activated in the intestine and the liver. And, when, and because of this, when you look at the onset of action, it is much slower clopidogrel, and it is much faster with prasugrel and ticagrelor. The individual variability in clopidogrel is large, whereas it's smaller in prasugrel and ticagrelor. And when you look at uh, all these reasons, you find that the potency is much higher for both prasugrel and ticagrelor, and the mean inhibition is about 50% for clopidogrel, 70% for prasugrel, and about 95% in ticagrelor. And uh, these are some of the reasons why it is recommended basing on the results that is found and favors ticagrelor and prasugrel as the uh, first line P2Y12 inhibitor together with aspirin in the treatment of acute coronary syndrome. And I just want to share with you the, uh, the guidelines uh, for patients, ACS, uh, who are treated with medical therapy. Now you should assess whether the patient has got high bleeding risk or low bleeding risk. If it is high bleeding risk, then or rather it is, if it is low bleeding risk, 
you should think about giving these patients for 12 months if they are high bleeding risk on medical therapy only for a period of one month. On the other hand, if you look at patients who received PCI for acute coronary syndrome, then uh, the, the, if there's no high bleeding risk, it is the same at least for 12 months. And if there's high bleeding risk, then you should consider uh, for giving for a period of six months. So that's what the current guidelines are. But really, if you look at the duration of the dual antiplatelet, it is the balance between ischemic and bleeding risk. And you have to decide one way or the other. And uh, therefore, when you look at all the data, you find that for prosubral and ticagrelor, they have a much higher bleeding risk as compared to aspirin and clopidogrel. And the risk of uh, bleeding is in patients who have what we call it as the uh, high bleeding risk profile. And you can actually base this on clinical uh, risk, or you have some risk score, bleeding risk scores that you can calculate to see whether a person has got high bleeding risk or low bleeding risk. And these are the precise DAPT and HESPAT score. But some of the things clinical that is being shared on the slide, elderly patients, renal failure, patients with bleeding peptic ulcers, going for surgeries, and so on and so forth. So these are patients at high bleeding risk, and you might want to consider not giving Number one, a long uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, or number two, you want to not try to prolong dual, uh, uh, the potent high uh, new uh, PTY12 inhibitor as long as you can. It means that you want to try and think whether you can shorten it. And uh, this is the, where the uh, de-escalation strategy comes on board, where you want to trade off between ischemic and bleeding risk. You then want to think about switching the more potent P2Y12 inhibitor, prasugral or ticagrelor to clopidogrel as a strategy to reduce bleeding. So if you look at the benefits of new P2Y12 inhibitor, because the fact that they are more potent, then they reduce the risk of thrombosis and the risk of ischemic event is much higher in the first one month. But after one month, and the longer you use dual antiplatelet therapy, and especially with the new potent P2Y12 inhibitor, then the higher the risk of bleeding. So you want to reduce the risk. So once again, if you look at the data and looking at the, uh, just specifically looking at bleeding risk for both in uh, Prasubra, Triton, TM38 and Plateau, the risk of bleeding is really found significantly after 30 days. So the longer you are, then the higher that risk. I just want to share with you two uh, studies that looked into de-escalation therapy. There are a number of studies that are uh, being looked at, but one of the interesting, uh, there are two interesting studies. The first is topic. This is a single uh, center study, timing of platelet inhibition after acute coronary syndrome, with the hypothesis that they had was, they wanted to look at efficacy and safety from a patient who are given uh, a new PTY12 inhibitor plus aspirin, and then they switch over to just clopidogrel and aspirin and followed up a period of one year. And the switching was at one month. So this is a study design. So randomization, either unchanged APT for 12 months or switch the APT at one month with the composite primary endpoints of death, urgent revascularization, stroke, or major bleeding of uh, at least bulk bleeding of more than two. But uh, to summarize the findings, you find that the primary endpoint was uh, favoring patients who had switched the APT as compared to one who and continued to be on the APT for 12 months with a new PTY12 inhibitor. Also the same when they looked at what is, uh, and they had a look at breakdown, and this is very important, the benefits was really seen in the reduction of bleeding, of, uh, of bulk bleeding of at least two or more. And when you look at the ischemic endpoint, there was actually no difference between the two arms. So at least from the topic study, we can conclude that if you were to change or switch, uh, in this case, the, the other term is de-escalate from the new PTY12 and aspirin that is recommended in the guidelines now for ACS, and you switch them to aspirin and clopidogrel, you find that there is a significant reduction in terms of bleeding, but at the same time, there was no difference in ischemic events uh, and at least that gives you uh, some comfort that the risk of stent thrombosis is not increased in a patient who received clopidogrel instead of a new PTY12 inhibitor.
The other uh, study, and this is an interesting and fairly complicated study, is looking at guided de-escalation. So they, uh, they assess whether to, the, to decide to de-escalate using platelet function, and the platelet function guides the de-escalation de uh, uh, therapy. So if you to look at this, these are patients who underwent PCI, and then they were divided, randomized one is to one. Either the control arm, where they were all given prasugrel throughout until 12 months, or they were given, a, uh, you know, uh, they were then divided into a guided uh, de escalation uh, group. Now, in the guided de escalation group, they were given prasugrel for seven days because they want to ensure that this patient has low risk of uh, ischemic events. And then they switch over to uh, clopidogrel for seven days. And all the control group and the guided de escalation group had. Uh, platelet function test tested. Now, in the guided de-escalation group, they will then see whether they have got low or no uh, high platelet reactivity or they have got high platelet reactivity. So high platelet reactivity is not good. So they, these are patients who require a stronger agent and they will continue to be on prasugram. Whereas those that has no high platelet reactivity, then they will switch over to uh, clopidogram. So when you look at uh, how this uh, 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 number of patients were given, so the control arm continued with Russell Brown, but in the guided de-escalation, 60% of them had no high platelet reactivity and therefore they were switched over to torpedo ground. And the ones that had high platelet reactivity, the so-called low responders, were, cons were considered to be important to be put and continued on Russell Brown. Now, this is an intention to treat between control and guided de-escalation, and the data suggests that uh, with regards to primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI stroke, or bleeding, there was actually a trend towards lower bleeding with the guided de-escalation group, even though it was not statistically significant. But it met the endpoint, and point was non-inferiority. So there was no inferior inferiority when you change over to a de-escalation strategy as compared to continuing with control. Now, they looked at uh, the second endpoint of ischemic endpoint and bark bleeding. And once again, there was uh, no difference in terms of uh, ischemic endpoint. And this is something which is uh, at least uh, reassuring. At the same time, there was a mild, or rather a trend towards a, a reduction in bleeding uh, as compared to the control arm. Now, the bleeding was uh, st uh, statistically significant in patients who are much younger in terms of uh, less than 70 years of age. So when you have less than 70 years of age, the risk of bleeding is lower in the uh, guided de-escalation de de group as compared to the standard arm. So what is new in the uh, 2018 guidelines with uh, all the some of the studies that have come out? So this is 2018. Obviously, we have more data in 2019 and 2020. But one of the uh, guidelines says that if it's possible, if you want to think about the escalation, it should be guided by platelet function tests for patients with acute one syndrome. But you and I know that uh, it's quite difficult to uh, uh, you know, get uh, uh, platelet uh, function tests uh, uh, as, com uh, as what is recommended by the expert consensus statement because it is not freely available. I'm not, I'm not sure whether Malaysia does it on a routine basis. We were thinking about doing a study before, but we're not doing it anymore. And there's variability in the platelet function test. But if you to look at what is the guidelines, the guidelines suggest that if you want to think about de-escalation, and this is where you consider that the bleeding risk is higher than the thrombotic risk, and then you look at the patient, you look at the clinical characteristics, you look at the patient, the, the uh, angioplasty that you did, how difficult was it, how complex was it, and then uh, you look at the socio-economic factors because one of the reasons you want to de-escalate is due to the cost because all these new PTY-12 inhibitors are very expensive and if it's possible, you do platelet function tests. Now, if you feel that they are suitable, then you may switch to a moderate PTY-12 inhibition by adding on clopidogrel to the aspirin. Now, we did not discuss about the other way around, but I'll just uh, cover it in, in this slide. Sometimes, sometimes you find that the clinical procedural characteristics is of concern and you know that these patients will have a much higher risk of uh, thrombotic episodes, ischemic events. 
then in this case, you may want to consider in switching from aspirin for the value you started with in the first place. Because sometimes not all people starts on the new PTY12, they start aspirin for the ground. You may want to consider to switch this over to a more potent new uh, the PTY12 inhibitor. An example is if we do uh, stenting, we use multiple stents, long stents, the results are not very clear, left in stem, and you can see, you confer, uh, your, your concern that uh, the risk of skin events is higher than these are patients. If you have started on propodogal to start off with, you may want to switch over to ticagrelor, for example. So what is the consensus recommendation on switching? So if you have a patient that you think you want to switch, it can be either de-escalation or escalation. There are two scenarios. One is a scenario of an acute or early phase and the other one in late or very late phase. Acute means to say that you may want to consider switching in the first 24 hours, whereas early phase is between one to 30 days. So if you, are, uh, you have a person on ticagrelor and the risk of bleeding is high and you want to switch over, then you should wait for at least 24 hours after the last ticagrelor dose, and then you load this patient with 600 milligrams of clopidogrel, and then followed by a maintenance dose of 75 milligrams daily. So that's when you want to switch de-escalate. On the other hand, if you want to escalate, it doesn't really matter the dose of uh, propidogrel uh, or the timing of propidogrel. You just load them with 180 milligrams of ticagrelor and 90 milligrams twice a day. I'm not covering prasugrel because prasugrel is not available in Malaysia. On the other hand, for the late, which is one month, one year, and also the very late phase, which is after one year, and you decide to switch then there is no difference between switching ticagrelor to clopidogrel. You need, still need to uh, load in this uh, clopidogrel, 600 milligrams, 24 hours of the last ticagrelor dose. But if you think of wanting to escalate clopidogrel to ticagrelor, then there is no uh, loading dose. You just continue with 90 milligrams twice a day, whatever the last dose of clopidogrel. So, once again, if you want to look at the switching or de-escalation strategy, it actually com occurs quite commonly in clinical practice. We don't, sometimes we don't really think about it, but sometimes there are certain scenarios that we may want to think about doing it. It is not recommended in all patients. It shouldn't be as a routine basis. If your patients are tolerating it uh, and you feel it's important to continue with the guidelines of 12 months, dual antiplatelet therapy, the patients can avoid no side effects then by all means, continue with your DAPP regimen. But if you want to think about de-escalating from a more potent P2I chop inhibitor to clopidogram with aspirin, then this is a reasonable approach, especially when you have patients with high bleeding risk, and sometimes you want to reduce cost. But if you do want to switch them over to a, low, a milder form of P2I chop inhibitor in, 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 in this the terms clopidogram, you need to identify that this patient should be at higher bleeding risk and with low ischemic risk. You, if it's possible, it is recommended to uh, identify good responders, but really, if you can't, then you look at the clinical scenario. Obviously, you want to try to avoid switching too early. So at least, at the very least, for 30 days before you think about switching. And use the recommended switching regimens that has been uh, mentioned uh, in the slide before. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, and when you look, uh, when you look at the de-escalation strategy, there, was, there are three main questions that one should ask before you want to switch. So it's not routine. So essentially the first one is which group of patients you want to consider the de-escalation, obviously looking at the high bleeding risk, the cost and compliance, whom not to de-escalate. If they have no bleeding, for example, then you want to consider in, uh, the, uh, you know, continuing with the DAPT for a much longer time. These are patients with high ischemic risk as some of the uh, things I described just now, which uh, especially with regards to procedural complexity. Then you want to consider the duration of DPT before considering the escalation. Obviously it depends on the risk of bleeding in ischemic event, but that is at this point in time, no real timing that uh, it will say to you that you should uh, consider when you should consider the escalation. In your clinical practice, you may consider at various points of views or various points of times. For example, when the patients come to your clinical visit, uh, 
one month, for example, you may want to decide at three months or even six months to try to de-escalate. And we also discuss on how to de-escalate in the acute early phase and in the late or very late phase. So I thank you very much for your uh, attention. I know that uh, this is an, uh, sometimes can be viewed as a difficult uh, subject. This, I must say, is different from the point that you want to just give good antiplatelet therapy and switch to just a single antiplatelet therapy. It's a different concept together. That's one form of de-escalation from a dual antiplatelet to a single antiplatelet. But in this case, we were discussing about de-escalating from a dual antiplatelet therapy using a potent P2 or 12 inhibitor to giving just aspirin and clopidogrel. So thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosli, and thank you for making this topic so, so relevant to the clinical practice by giving the actual scenarios and correlating the dots from the data. Yes, this is an evolving topic, and as, uh, as you correctly said, there will be a few more data coming up, understanding the patient profile and the need of the profile of patients. So I think uh, now it's the time after these two interesting sessions to have some Q&A. We have seen some of the Q&As were being answered by Dr. Chu. But uh, then uh, we would like to ask a few of them uh, online also, so that other audience can also be benefited from them. To start the first question, which I have received, maybe uh, Dr. Rosli, we will start from you, just you have finished your topic. Uh, so we have uh, Shah Zeb is asking the question, excellent talk by you. I just want to know for which patient you are recommending platelet function test. All right. So that's a very uh, important question. But, um, you know, uh, obviously, again, uh, this is a limitation. For example, practically in Malaysia, uh, I'm not sure uh, whether there's any centers actually doing it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure if we can uh, find out about it. The testing itself is not going to be cheap. But if, let's say, if I were to have the ability of the testing platelet function, and I don't want to do it as a routine basis, then I would want to find out whether I'm going to be comfortable about de-escalating uh, my medications. Then obviously I would like to try uh, and uh, I would like to use it in patients with high bleeding risk. That gives me an, uh, an, uh, you know, a sense of whether it's possible for me to reduce that uh, or to de-escalate and for patients where cost and compliance is an issue. Now, and compliance is sometimes when you take the rule of, for example, patient has dyspnea, I've had one or two patients with very difficult dyspnea, and this side effects may actually uh, make them want to stop the tickle group. Now, the other aspect is that you need to remember uh, that patients with high bleeding risk are not the same. So, for example, a patient with age, for example, more than 75, they are at a high bleeding risk, but obviously they are not very high bleed, uh, risk as compared to a person who had bleeding in the past, for example, had a stroke or had a bleeding peptic ulcer. So I believe that if you can, then you, and uh, because of all these factors, cause uh, uh, availability of PFT and so on, you may want to tailor it uh, in the patients that you feel that you, when you want to de-escalate this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosli. Another question, Dr. Chu, I will just address. I can see you have answered it, but again, for the audience to have more benefit from that question. The question was, may I know what is the rationale behind of asking patient to break half of those combination med medicine, for example, Twinstar, most of the patients to actually complain that the medicine short of melted or softened when they keep the over halves. What we do actually consult patient not to break into the half combination medicine. I think we have already answered, but just for the other audience. Sure. So, uh, yes, I agree. It is a very common practice, especially in the primary care, that patients are advised to break the scorn medication, break them to half. And I think that the main reason to, for this is for cost saving. Um, you have to be sure that the formulation that you are getting the patient to break is allowed to be scored and they are stable uh, in, the, in exposed to the room air. The, the uh, question came with the specific name of Twin Star. There are specific formulations that cannot be sort of exposed to room air once you've broken them and attempt to sort of melt and become unstable. So if you ever want to do that, well, in general, we try to use the whole tablet if possible. But if there's a need to break, make sure that the, the manufacturer allows you to, to break that and there is a stability of the product. And if there's any indication that the product becomes unstable, 
unstable, like it melts, and you find that the patient's blood pressure becomes sort of labile or not consistently controlled, you, that suggests that there's some issue with the quality of medication once it's broken. So you should not do that. Thank you. Thank you for that clear answer, Dr. Chu. Dr. Chu, another question from your table is how we can differentiate between primary and secondary hypertension. So if you just look at the phenotypic expression by, by the blood pressure measurement, there's no difference. You cannot differentiate whether it's primary or secondary. Most important is you must have a key or high index of suspicion that this particular patient may be having a secondary hypertension. And one of the sort of standard things that we do, if you have a young patient that presents with an unexplained high blood pressure, you must always look for a secondary hypertension. Essential hypertension is the most common one, and most of the time is multifactorial. You will not be able to find an underlying cause. So any young patient, you will go through a battery of tests, including renal function tests, maybe some imaging of the kidneys. You're going to check some of the hormones as well. Um, sometimes and make sure that you check the, the blood pressure on both arms for presence of possible coarctation. So these are the things that must come to your mind when you have a young patient. Or... If the patient has got issues from the screening, uh, abnormal renal function, you've got to think about the cause of high blood pressure being renal failure. If, always check the patient's concomitant medications. There are some patients taking unsuspecting uh, steroids in their medication that can cause blood pressure rise. Or if they have expression of Cushing syndrome, always think about those things. So it's always from the suspicion that you lead you to further investigate. But clear cut, any young person with uh, unexplained high blood pressure, you should screen for secondary cause. Thanks, Dr. Chu. And the question to Dr. Rosley, uh, the, the questioner is, Hi, I'm Dr. Win Koo Koo from Myanmar. The patient experienced the upper GI bleeding confirmed by endoscopy within one month after doing PCI and receiving DAPT. What, what should we do regarding DAPT? Okay, uh, I mean, I, also, I think we should also consider the second question, which is how do you adjust dual antiplatelet therapy in a patient? Correct, with yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, okay. True, I, I would uh, definitely want you to come on board because, again, uh, guidelines are guidelines, uh, but most times or not, when you have a, a person who's bleeding, it's always, you know, your own personal way of uh, doing things. So you may have some a bit different, um, and we can then share how you and I uh, can uh, manage this. But, okay, firstly, if you feel that the person has got high bleeding risk to start off with, and when, you do, when you're doing a PCI, I would choose a stent because stent is very important. Sometimes stents uh, can also reduce the risk of uh, ischemic events. I would choose a stent that I can have the liberty of using a short dual antiplatelet fine uh, therapy. So if you want to see that the, the stents that are now given CE mark for one month, the APT would be the Biofreedom in the first study, uh, and then the CREATE and also the ONIX uh, stents. So these are stents which have been shown to be useful. Synergy has got some data, but not uh, marked, uh, given approval yet. Uh, so choose the stents very well, so that at least you know that you can uh, change uh, the, the APT uh, to a, even a single trial <laughs> epithelial much earlier. Then you have a bleeding episode. The question is, bleeding is early or bleeding is late? Bleeding is late, at least you know that you're quite, uh, you know, protected in the sense that the first month is the one that has got high ischemic risk. Uh, the worst that can happen is when you have a bleeding episode that occurs in hospital after, right after you've done a, a PCI. And that can be uh, troubling because if, for example, with a question from uh, Dr. Win from Myanmar, if endoscopy, obviously they will, uh, the patients would be seen by endoscope, uh, um, the gastroenterologist, I would hope that he would have done clippings and therefore stop the bleeding. Uh, there would be a, a potential that I may stop the antiplatelet therapy for about a day or at the most two, and then I will think about restarting it. Now, the reason is uh, in cases like this, again, it's anecdotal. It is not based on guidelines. It's my own. Uh, if I were to think about the risk of bleeding and the risk of bleeding is highest with aspirin, then I may just want to give a, a, a potent P2I drop in a, as a single dose. Or if I feel that uh, the bleeding risk has now gone down substantially after uh, you know, the clippings and uh, IV uh, PPIs, then I would want to start just on aspirin and clopidogrel, just to make sure that the risk of bleeding is a bit less. But once again, it's anecdotal. Uh, 
the worst I can think of is an intracranial bleed. Uh, that is uh, something which is, uh, you know, uh, difficult. Then you have to assess from patient to patient. You have to see how large the bleeding uh, in an intracranial bleed is. If there's a large intracranial bleed, your hands are really tied. Uh, you know, you want to try to delay the uh, restarting of the antiplatelet uh, as long as you can, at least at the, to the point in time that you think is going to be safe. But if it's a large intracranial bleed, it's quite likely that uh, it's going to be quite difficult for, to, for you to restart dual antiplatelet therapy in any time. So, difficult subject, clinical, and it has got to relate between uh, uh, your own experience. It has to relate with, uh, as what is bleeding in the patient. Chu, Gimui, what, what about you? Well, I totally agree with uh, what you have mentioned. Just to add on, the, the need to sort of truncate the DAPT or shorten the intensive anti antiplatelet therapy is real. And one of the things that you mentioned is very uh, helpful is this, in the sense that you will sense that the, you will have, um, might have to truncate the uh, DAPT um, duration. One is the selection of the, some, some stand platforms which are maybe safer. Uh, also to make sure that your PCI or intervention pursuit is done as best as possible, meaning that you have good expansion of the stand, there's no injury to the adjacent vessel to minimize the chance of ischemic problem later on. So that's another thing to look at. If the patient develop bleeding anyway, because there may be a temporary discontinuation of the a both or even uh, a single antiplatelet, but we need to find out the cause. If the cause is reversible, meaning perhaps it's just a H. pylori associated uh, peptic ulcer, there is also the opportunity that you want to restart the APT after a brief sort of de-escalation to a single, and then you might restart once the ulcer has healed and so on. Especially in those whom you think that as a Higher ischemic risk, for example, they have multiple stents put in or very complex lesions. So these are the things that you have to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rosli and Dr. Chu. We are approaching towards the end of the session, but still I will, if you permit, I may ask one or two more questions and then we end the session. Yep. Thank you. So uh, I think, Dr. Chu, there is one question which you have already tried, but it says, Dr. Chu, what's your opinion about using AVPM for monitoring? When do you think it's necessary for achieving the target goals? Is it enough to ask our patients to measure the VP themselves? Okay, so uh, ABPM, um, if you look at the, uh, the UK guideline, has been for many years in the uh, guidelines put a forth as the key way to determine whether the patient has got high blood pressure. That is because from our understanding that these out of office measurements, ABPM is perhaps the most sort of consistent in results and most predictive of the patient's outcome. So you would normally not do it routinely just to monitor whether the patient's control is good. You will want to do some form of this uh, out of office management. If you suspect either the patient is having mass hypertension, meaning that it seems to be quite well controlled in the clinic, but at home they may be high because patients report to you that measurements at home are actually high. Or uh, it could be you're worried about whether the control is seemingly poor because of white coat hypertension, that's where it comes in. So this is where you compare whether you, you believe the patient's own home blood pressure monitor against the ambulatory blood pressure. The ABPM will be more definitive in this case. If you have suspicion that the home blood pressure monitor may not be accurate, also make sure that the patient's home set is well calibrated. So not a routine, but if you have suspicion of all this um, at home um, mass or high coat hypertension, you might want to consider doing an ABPM. Thank you, Dr. Chu. And I think, Dr. Rosli, I will take it as a last question and then we will try to wrap up and the remaining we will try to approach you separately or if any other question arises. This question on your screen is already talking about a case, if you can see clearly, a 34-year-old gentleman, PCI to RCA for acute inferior MI. It's a long question. I think you can address this question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, number one, I've typed up briefly uh, the question, but uh, the... Rice, Rice syndrome, as far as I can recall, is of concern in patients uh, who have been in the pediatric age group. The younger the age group, then uh, the risk the concern is high. Uh, but I'm not sure in adults. I don't really think that uh, adults should pose as a problem. But having said that, uh, the question is, uh, if you need to uh, change to clopidogrel, do remember clopidogrel also has got a small risk uh, 
of uh, you know uh, uh, platelet uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, that's something that needs to be considered. Uh, but I'm not. Really, I think if platelet is low and person has got all symptoms in in, in Malaysia, we tend to think of dengue as first uh, line. So you have to ensure that uh, you know the patient has not high risk of bleeding. You may have to assess. Uh, if you feel like stopping antiplatelet therapy, then you stop antiplatelet therapy and then you just monitor the patient's platelet and look for any bleeding. If there's none, then you can safely restart uh, the aspirin. Thank you, Dr. Rosli. Thank you, Dr. Chu. We have already approached towards the end of the session and thanks for taking out time. I could sense and we discussed yesterday, it was one of the very, very busy days for you. At the end, thanks to all the participants from different countries, Indonesia and Philippines also, and Malaysia, for ad attending this session, which was practically very, very genuinely answered your questions, and I'm very, very personally happy. Before we actually end the session, just one request. Uh, I will just launch a small two-question poll to, for us to capture how would you recommend this webinars to other healthcare professionals, and what's your overall satisfaction rate this webinar? This will help us to improvise the different elements in the future. So we'll give a few seconds for all the participants to answer this question, and then we will formally close the session. So on my side, I would like uh, to thank everyone for logging in. And we know that, uh, Chu and I know that it's on a Saturday. Uh, and obviously we would like to uh, thank uh, Sanofi for being a partner with uh, CVSKL in having this webinar. Uh, and when I listen to Chu, I, I learn a lot from Chu. So. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's also a learning thing for me. Yes, yes. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You know, and and you, know, Dr. Chu, just before the audience are finishing off this question, I your white white coat hypertension applies to corporate life as well. <laughs> so when your superior walks in, your VP is high, <laughs> and then you are relaxed. So I think the phenomena is quite known to us as well. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. And uh, we have received almost uh, many, many responses. So here I will end the poll. And with this, we come to the end of this webinar. Again, thanks to all of you. Thanks to our esteemed panelists today for giving us such a lot of knowledge. But we cannot end the session without saying thanks to all the healthcare professionals during this time of COVID. You were already doing whatever best possible for the patients, but this week, Time has given all of us a lot of learnings in terms of even connecting to the patients from remote locations. So we all are co-learning in this time and we hope a very safe stay for all of us and for all of you. Take care of yourself and thanks for giving time. Thanks again, Dr. Rosley, Dr. Chu for being with us today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.